Welcome to the 32nd edition of the Decolonial Learning Session from Arales, a pan-decolonial network and grassroots organization in Amsterdam. My name is Pravini Baburam, I go by she or pronouns, and I am the moderator of the evening. For those who are not yet familiar with the Decolonial Learning Sessions, these are monthly sessions, sometimes in English like today, sometimes in Dutch, and if you want to stay up to date, you can follow our newsletter, website, Facebook, and Instagram. The sessions are on a donation basis and therefore accessible to everyone. Uh, we do ask your support to be able to offer our speakers a token of appreciation through donation. Um, and today in this edition, we'll talk about how to strengthen the decolonial movement in European civil society. I'm very, very happy to welcome our guest speakers for today. Arti Narsi, a South African intersectional feminist former journalist and activist who works as a civic space expert and is actively working to bring an intersectional and decolonial lens to civil society. Sima Saida. Uh, Sima is head of communications at European Alternatives and a campaigner with Another Europe is Possible. She organizes an ongoing transnational campaign against Islamophobia, including research into anti-Muslim hatred in Germany and the UK. Rachel Nellams, a global campaigner, trainer, communicator, connector, and facilitator from the Pacific Northwest of the Turtle Islands, also known as North America, with political and NGO experience across three continents. And Martin de Goot, an organizer with a background in EU democracy-related civil society field who's trying to use his privileges for the purpose of collective liberation. All of the speakers are part of Decolonial Europe Day, an initiative that uses the occasion of Europe Day, 9th uh, of May every year, to bring together existing decolon uh, decolonizing initiatives, civil society organizations, and other actors around the common project of decolonizing Europe, understood as an ongoing process. And today, they'll dive into the question of decolonizing Europe. What does it mean in the European context? But what will it take considering the current political climate in European countries? And if you want to strengthen the decolonial movement in Europe, what are aspects we need to be mindful of? What are successes that already have been achieved and what are challenges we need to tackle? To discuss these questions, every speaker will briefly share their reflections. If you have questions about particular topics they address, please ask them in the chat or raise your hand. And after the panel discussion, we'll take a short break of five minutes and then we'll open the floor for reflections and discussion and more questions from the audience. Again, everything is being recorded so you can view it on our blog. Uh, and now that the introductions are out of the way, I would like to uh, hand the floor over to the guest speakers, starting with Rachel. Hi, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, my name is Rachel Nellums, um, and like it was mentioned, I come from the northwest of Turtle Island. Um, this is the indigenous name given to the land that is commonly known as North America. Um, and so I've worked and lived in so-called Canada and so-called Australia, and in both and in, in both those contexts, it's very commonplace um, to start every gathering or coming together um, and in some cases uh, it's sort of determined that even a coming together of five people um, should start with uh, something called a land acknowledgement and a land acknowledgement is a statement of acknowledgement uh, that pays respect to the land and the indigenous people as the historic and enduring stewards of that land. And it also acknowledges that that land was stolen um, and pays respect to the ongoing relationships that the indigenous people of the land continue to have um, reaching into the past and the present and the future. Um, and by doing this practice at the beginning of events, it's at a, of every event, it's a way of interrupting from the beginning and disrupting and confronting the colonial reality that the given event is taking place in. It situates the conversation um, and grounds participants in 
the the history, the present, and building towards um, the future. It also confronts and lays bare the contradictions that uphold um, our societies, you know, on that colonized land, but in in general in society. Um, and we can we can see how um, laying bare these contradictions um, can even can feel really uncomfortable um, and even show the how ludicrous <laughs> the situation um, is. So as an example, there's sort of um, an ongoing joke that people will use to illustrate, which sort of says, imagine if every time you went to go watch a TV, you started by acknowledging uh, that this was actually Dave's TV and that you stole Dave's TV and that we really thank Dave for giving us for allowing us to have the TV. He probably didn't actually allow it because we stole it, but we're not going to give Dave's TV back. Um, and just how how uh, contradicting that is to the values that, you know, our societies in Europe um, and in the kind of European colonized world sort of says to uphold. Um, and so if I were to be doing this talk from the land that I most call home and which my ancestors settled on six generations ago as part of that European colonial land theft, I would acknowledge the Coast Salish the Kwangan people of the Songhees and Esquimalt First Nations on southern Vancouver Island. Um, the traditional language spoken by those people is the Lekwungen language. Um, and there's actually only one native language speaker left, um, though there are ongoing efforts to reawaken and revive uh, the language. I've um, seen uh, and read that in the land uh, of British Columbia, um, there were as many languages as Europe, and the languages um, were as distinct as Finnish and Greek, um, but the vast majority have all but disappeared, um, and in many cases there are as few as five people who continue to speak those languages, um, and uh, many of them not as a first language. So. Um, yeah, there are 70 remaining distinct languages in 12 language families uh, across so-called Canada. And I think um, by sort of pointing that out, which is a reality that I think many in uh, Europe aren't um, necessarily aware of, that these continuing cultures, nations, and societies continue to endure um, despite their historic um, dispossession, displantment, displanting, and um, displacement that have happened historically and continue to continue to this day. Um, so here in Europe, um, I've uh, found myself imagining what a similar interrupting of the of that space, a similar confronting of those colonial contradictions um, of the land that I, I sit on. Um, so I'm here in Brussels in Belgium. And um, if I were to do um, a stolen wealth acknowledgement here, um, that would probably be pretty focused on the horrific colonization and stolen wealth from the Congo, which was um, for uh, over 100 years exploited for its ivory and rubber and even uranium, which was, uh, of course, a crucial element in the atomic bomb, um, which was a story not told in Oppenheimer, which just got the Oscar and has a lot of the global attention. Um, and um, sort of to to lay bare just how stark some of that um you know product of violent um racism uh was um so congo got its independence in 1960 but you can see the complete outright levels of racism um not not so long ago um in that there was the sort of uh, last of the human zoos in belgium in 1958 um 
and um, to point to the you know the current the current context as well. Um, it's said that Congo is sitting on about twenty four trillion dollars worth of natural resources, but um, three in four people are living on one one dollar ninety per day. Um, while here in Brussels, we are um, walking past incredible monuments uh, to extravagance and wealth um, uh, sort of decreed and um, put in place largely by uh, Leopold II, the, the previous king, um, and just sort of sitting with and acknowledging the, the contradictions of, you know, having the European civil society, EU, um, Brussels uh, space to be sitting amongst so much wealth that was stolen while continuing to um, sort of put forward and um, preach values that contradict um, that sort of level of violence and um, stealing. So, um, yeah, um, for my context, um, a, a book that I really recommend is um, a book by Patty Crowich, which is called Becoming Kin, an Indigenous call to unforgetting the past and reimagining our future. Um, and you can read it in sort of five hours. It's quite um, accessible. Um, and I really, really recommend sort of hearing the, the history of displantment that's happened um, across Turtle Island. Um, I'm gonna, how am I, how am I doing for time? <laughs> yes, um, you have about two minutes. So if there's anything you would like to kind of say. Sure, yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll um, end just with the fact that um, if there is a critique of land acknowledgements, um, it's that it, um, it's when it can become tokenistic or sort of ticking a box. And um, I think that that's because it stops sort of um, serving the purpose of inviting people towards further knowledge and disrupting and uh, interrupting colonial spaces. And so I think, um, I think I put this challenge to people here to imagine how they can interrupt uh, and disrupt and acknowledge sort of from, from the beginning and sort of acknowledging the fact that um, the, the place of Europe that has colonized and displanted and displaced uh, people all around the world is um, so overrepresented by white people. And what does it look like to acknowledge that from the start and to sort of disrupt and what what discomfort can come from that and what else can that lead to? Yes, thanks, Rachel. That's really an amazing um, and very concrete tool, actually. I, I really appreciate the the translation of a, a disruptive um, strategy from you know uh, an, a context outside of Europe uh, to uh, you know um, yeah spaces here where if if I understand it right it's not so much about land acknowledgement but wealth acknowledgement and recognizing uh, and making explicit how that wealth came to be um, and having a, an, an, a disruptive um, a strategy to yeah to make people aware of their position of power also from a historical perspective yeah absolutely yeah so i think that's a really yeah interesting and concrete tool if you talk about strengthening the decolonial movement it's really an invitation right to all of us to to practice with this kind of acknowledgement in the spaces we enter so uh, thank you for uh, for your uh, reflection and and i'm sure we'll come back to you also in conversation uh, but for now, I would like to uh, pass it on to Seema. Hi, thanks everyone. Um, my electricity just went and the Wi-Fi just went as well, so I've rejoined on my mobile phone. Can you all hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Perfect. Okay, so what I wanted to speak about today was a bit more about the micro-level 
um, experience of being a person of colour in European civil society, trying to play a role in anti-racism, trying to play a role with decolonizing, although I'm going to uh, put some controversial statements out there in terms of how I feel that's going and, and, and our position in the global north as well as people who are claiming to be decolonizing too, since I do believe that decolonization inherently is going to be global south led and led by people who have directly experienced colonization or are directly living in uh, the spaces that are uh, uh, are under neo colonization as well. Um, so from a micro perspective, I think it's quite interesting to talk about my own experience and firstly, how I ended up in Europe. And I would say, firstly, my family history and background is from Bangladesh. And Bangladesh was obviously colonized by the British. Um, Bengal specifically underwent a horrific famine when Churchill was prime minister, where three million people died because he intentionally starved the country. Um, and where I lived in Bangladesh uh, was severely affected by the Bangladesh-Pakistan war, which of course is partly created by the British in the sense that Winston Churchill hated the idea of Indian independence. He uh, and British secret services were very much involved in um, fostering and uh, popularizing um, Muslim separatism as well. Um, actually, prior to the partition of India, uh, in the north of India, uh, farmers parties cross ethnicity and cross religion were quite popular and winning the elections. So there was this unity of classes in India that the British hated. And I think this background is really important because one thing that my dad always used to tell me, he grew up in Bangladesh and came to Britain as an adult, was that when he was uh, six years old, he had to flee his house which was on fire due to the civil war. And he recalls seeing um, somebody dead, dying on the floor, begging for water and a soldier just um, pouring water in front of his face. Uh, so it, there's this huge level of trauma from these wars that were directly created by colonial powers, by the British, that deeply affect gen generations in Bangladesh. Another big consequence of the famine in Bengal and the and it was not just the Bengal famine, there were many famines, is that now it's actually research shows that in the DNA of people of South Asian descent, we're more likely to have heart disease, diabetes. Um, we have different levels of BMI uh, that lead to unhealthy consequences. We die much earlier. The medical system is colonized it, both in Europe and uh, and in colonized countries. So um, all of this on a whole level, uh, shows that the consequences of colonization are still very much here. So in my family, for instance, my dad passed away very young from a heart attack. Um, and all of these health issues are still things that our community as a whole uh, suffers from. In COVID-19, the Bangladeshi Muslim community was one of the worst affected um, and had one of the highest death rates in the UK. So all of these histories of colonialism on the macro level also impact us all on a micro level and have had a really big impact on me. I would also say that coming from a Bangladeshi Muslim family growing up in the metropole in London, uh, we lived in a council estate at the start uh, in uh, Whitechapel, East London, which is quite famous for having a lot of migrants and migrant communities. Um, my mum uh, was actually the breadwinner and she experienced a lot of racism at work, often lost jobs. And the trade union movement, I'm sorry to say, hasn't decolonized itself and isn't as anti-racist as it could be, and especially at the time when I was a kid, it wasn't supporting migrant workers uh, to keep their jobs. There was an interest for the white white workers, basically, uh, to keep their jobs over migrant workers. So we had a lot of economic instability, and that led to evictions and homelessness whilst I was a kid. So um, there was always quite a lot of precarity in my life living in the UK. As When I was eight years old, um, I went back to Bangladesh, and that's something that I... Uh, remember very strongly because seeing the state of Bangladesh and the way that colonization has robbed the wealth of Bangladesh before the British colonized Bangladesh, um, and this is something that you referred to earlier, um, the weavers in Bangladesh were actually earning more and had a better standard of life than uh, manufacturing workers in the UK. Now that was all completely flipped over due to colonization, due to the extraction of 
the wealth of Bangladesh and the wealth of Britain, its manufacturing industry, and the state of Bangladesh as a captured market for manufactured goods is also um, all a result of colonization. And so um, going to Bangladesh and seeing the way the country was really shocked me. And I didn't actually understand colonization at the time. I didn't understand the history because obviously nobody teaches it. And it's something that's stolen from us and is completely erased. So um, for that reason, I, I studied history at university. I did a master's in world history, which was having a more anti-colonial perspective. And that brought me to an understanding of the world we are in today. And that what also motivated me beyond against the wishes of my family who who want us uh, a lot of immigrant families in Europe want their kids to become doctors or lawyers or have more stable careers to go more into activism and civil society. Now, obviously, as I'm in Europe, I also have all of the privileges that Europe has. I benefit from um, the imperial wage or the imperial uh, the, the imperial social wage. I have, you know. Uh, th this phone uses a lithium battery. I have internet. I have electricity. I've I've quite a good standard of living now. So um, balancing these different positionalities that I have and the co inherent contradictions of that is something that I'm still struggling with. And I don't think there's a clear solution to that. So um, from that positionality, existing in civil society is really really difficult. I would say that. Um, moving from the UK, where I think a lot more progress has been made in terms of understanding racism in society, understanding at least the importance of some kind of representation, understanding that lived experience as well is really important when it comes to the anti-racist struggle, and especially in the migrants' rights sector as well. Recently, when you see adverts for jobs and things like that, lived experience is really important. And although it's not perfect in the UK, far from perfect, actually, that I can see lots of efforts being made for, for lived experience to be um, uh, prioritised, whereas coming to European civil society is uh, really actually quite shocking to see the level at which uh, people of colour basically are just totally excluded from European civil society. And I think what's even more shocking is seeing that a lot of the funding for projects in Europe actually requires more like anti-discrimination, diversity, even the question of decolonization is something that is now coming into uh, the principles for funding. Yet this means that for a lot of civil society organizations and NGOs who are good at doing funding applications and have the resources and intellectual know how to do that because of uh, structures of white supremacy and colonial structures, then consume all of those resources, which really should be channeled to grassroots organizations, organizations, grassroots organizers, um, people with lived experience, people on the front line who have forced migration from colony, col formerly colonized countries because of colonial dynamics. But instead, it's kind of being sucked up in the NGO sphere. And I do really wonder whether that is good or not, you know. However, I am here in the NGO sphere. And what I see day to day is really the engagement with decolonization, with racism, it's almost like it's a buzzword. And uh, uh, it's very rare that you'll go to an event about decolonization, in my view, um, and find people actually talking about the history of colonization, about the wealth exploitation. Instead, it's it uh, the practice of decolonization becomes something about, sometimes it's about senses and um, meditations and things like this, which is, I think, important parts of the practice, but without the actual historical knowledge and the politics of it, it does for me sometimes seem a bit empty. And also, um, prioritizing the voices of people with colonized history and backgrounds doesn't seem to be a big thing. So for me, it feels like I'm really going back in time and actually trying to advocate in quite hostile spaces for really basic things to be implemented, like if you're doing an event on decolonization or migration, make people with lived experience of migration or people with colonized histories visible. It doesn't even mean they have to be totally visible. You know, the space can be shared, but at least make sure that the space is framed and shaped uh, by people with lived experience. So these are quite basic things that I've been trying to push for. And in doing so, I do come up across what people call microaggressions, but which actually are just racism. For instance, I've been trying to push a lot of the anti-Islamophobia work that um, I've been 
supporting from the UK into Europe because I think the UK is very bad on Islamophobia but there are there is Muslim self-organizing happening and we do have a definition of Islamophobia that's been recognized by most political parties which is getting us somewhere but in Europe for instance in Germany the SPD hasn't got a recognized definition so pushing for this kind of small uh, reformist stuff uh, is something that I'm trying to do and I, um, and France especially is extremely bad with Islamophobia and this is something that in the UK people just kind of assume and no, whereas if you come to France and you talk to people who are on the left and progressives and you start talking about Islamophobia, anti-Muslim hatred, they're just like, oh, what? Is that a thing? Like, you get denials that it doesn't exist. And also, um, people have told me that stuff that I've said is very overstated or exaggerated. Reports that we published are, are not true. So really, and, and the people who say this are often kind of white, uh, quite middle class activists who would portray themselves as anti-racist. So... Um, just having those interactions and living them every day is emotionally exhausting, I have to say. Like, I really feel every day, like, emotionally exhausted. And even one interaction like that can uh, live with me for days afterwards or weeks or even months. And it plays around in my head because sometimes the power dynamics of the situation mean I can't in that moment call that person out and say, actually, what you said is totally wrong. Um, and because... Um, yeah, yes. sorry. I think I've been yeah, yeah, no, it's also being, being mindful of time, but I think you touch on so many aspects that I'm quite sure, you know, a lot of people can relate to and also would like to uh, to uh, to discuss further. So um, can I suggest that we come back to you, you know, uh, uh, also uh, in the Q&A uh, and allow people, you know, to to also um, engage with, with those questions you put on the table, if that's, if that's okay for you? Yeah, yeah and I've made those key uh, points, so thank you. Yeah, no, and also I, I think it's really um, interesting how you address, at least what I took from your uh, reflections, is also the intergenerational part of, you know, colonization, the traumas, not just uh, uh, psychological, but also actually uh, physically, you know, in, 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 in our health, um, uh, as in, in our bodies, but uh, also in the systems that are supposed to take care of our bodies and how that's still colonized uh, today. And also, kind of the the the, the power relations, um, uh, especially in you know uh, civil society, where uh, it's interesting. And I I can imagine we can we can come back to this also. You know, on the one hand, decolonizing is now a buzzword, as you say, much like you know we've had diversity for a long time. Sometimes, also in my experience, people think those are the same: <laughs> diversity and inclusion and, and decolonization. Um, and on the one hand, it shows that, you know, it's it's becoming a mainstream conversation, which is interesting because it opens the door for the critical conversations, yet those conversations are not taking place. So what does that mean, right, for the movement? So yeah, I think it's really interesting how you address all those layers uh, in the conversation. So thank you once again for, uh, for now. And then um, I suggest we hand it over to Arti. Yes. Thank you so much um, for having us. And um, yeah, thanks to Sima and Rachel for getting us started. I think I would probably be echoing a lot of what, um, or building on what at least what Sima has um, started to talk about in, in terms of the micro level. Um, but I wanted to focus um, the next few minutes just on looking at the macro level um, as someone who is based in Brussels. Um, just recently moved here, so it's been eight months um, of being in the um, so-called Brussels bubble, as people call it here, um, and I find myself actively trying to burst the bubble and poke the bubble in, and yeah, just disrupt it in all ways possible, um, but I mean, I think Sima was also reflecting on, you know, um, working in spaces maybe that you know anti-racism spaces or spaces where maybe there's already kind of some sort of mention about decolonization um whereas in in the work that i do so predominantly focusing on civic space and democracy um the term decolonization is I'm, i mean I'm, I'm lucky i'm surprised if it even gets mentioned um Right, it's it's often completely absent from any conversation, um, 
which is which is shocking because if we're talking about you know protecting uh, rights for all and the you know fundamental rights and um, quoting the EU Charter for fundamental rights, you know which links to um, you know the right to protest, the right to association, etc., the right to dignity, non-discrimination, etc. Um, why is it that this term decolonization is um, not even spoken about? So for me, I wanted to highlight that in my experience um, is that the civil society in Europe is often reinforcing and reproducing the, the colonial structures and the power dynamics that, um, you know, that is representative of the so-called European project. Um, and I just wanted to give some practical examples of how we are seeing this. Um, one in terms of the narratives that civil society is using, um, but also then in terms of how they operate, how they do their work in practice. So when it comes to um, the narratives that they are using, for example, um, we know that how we say things matter. And we see that, um, you know, a decolonial narrative or thinking is completely absent from um, the sort of um, narratives that those working on democracy use. So in the spaces where I've engaged with organizations working on democracy, we often see them using words like citizenship in a very exclusive, not inclusive way. Um, they often use terms like sovereignty, national security. Um, we need to protect EU borders. Um, and we know that all of these um, things are, you know, colonial by nature um, and deeply rooted and deeply violent for those people who have to, um, you know, deal, for example, with um, Frontex and, and, you know, um, come across the EU borders or crossing EU borders. Um, and at the same time, we also see that um, something that really, um, made me very uncomfortable when, when I came to the Brussels bubble was this repeated use of the word European values and you know the fight for the European project, which I'm sure many of you will be hearing even in, in um, light of the upcoming European elections, which the civil society is very much engaged in. Um, and for me, it just again reiterates that the civil society has failed to account for um, uh, Europe's historical legacy um, as a colonial project. It fails to also recognize, um, you know, the study of democracy and how it's linked to capitalism, colonialism, and that we cannot build, um, you know, we cannot talk about democracy that is built on a capitalist, colonialist um, extraction and exploitation. So, um, but because the civil society is using these terms and, you know, speaking about it because it represents them, um, we see that a decolonial thinking is completely um, absent from, from the work that they do and from the way in which they, they interact. Um, and then at the very practical level in terms of, um, you know, how they are, how civil society is operating, um, I think that the, the civil society in Europe is very much working within the systems and structures that we as decolonial activists are trying to dismantle. Um, so by virtue of having to interact with the European institutions, um, for example, I have to do it in in my daily, my daily job. Um, we see that uh, within the European institutions itself, within the ways in which you have the different, you know, DGs within uh, the types of policies or things that they apply to funding, for example, um, again, fail to account for this colonial history, um, its impact on colonized people. And it continues to just reproduce uh, these colonial structures in, in the policies and the way they communicate. Um, and you only have to look at the way in which, for example, um, the EU is legislating on migration, for, for example, and the, you know, the weakening of protections. Um, at the moment, they are um, doing a reform of the EU Schengen border um, sort of regulation, which again, basically, um, you know, green lights pushbacks um, on the borders of EU. Um, and the fact that civil society that is talking about this um, don't uh, look at it through a decolonial lens. Um, you know, we don't see them using this language. We don't see them saying, um, 
the border issue um, or the issue with EU borders and the way in which migrants are criminalized, the way in which people who help migrants are criminalized, um, is goes again to the root um, and the history of colonialism in Europe. And the, the idea of you know protecting borders and sovereignty is part of the colonial project, but we don't see this sort of narrative actively coming out in, in some of those kind of, I would say, mainstream organizations working on, on migration. Um, so in many ways, I think that um, the civil society um, mirrors the colonial history, um, even in the ways in which they they operate. And I think Sima touched on this, is that, um, you know, they, this tokenism tick box kind of thing, they claim that they work for, you know, marginalized groups or that they want to represent rights for all. Um, but what they end up doing is, is a lot of harm. Um, for example, they like to speak on behalf of people with lived experiences. Um, so rather than giving, you know, um, uh, people of uh, religious or ethnic minorities a, a seat at the table, for example, in, in my case, maybe talking about civic space or, or democracy, um, instead of doing that, they, I guess, adopt the white savior complex um, um, thing of representing, speaking on behalf of, um, they can't be here because, I don't know, I think mostly it's honestly a lack of trying and lack of um, accessibility and making or creating a context in which um, colonized people and people um, with a lot of experience feel safe to speak um, and to be heard. Um, and this is the biggest problem, is that um, often if... Um, they invite people who have this sort of lived experience. It's um, to invite them as a dick box exercise, as Seema said. Um, it often feels very extractive, um, where they extract their time and resources by, as I put, consulting them. You know, come and tell us, um, but we don't want to give you a seat at the table to make a decision. We don't want to give you any power. We don't want to, um, you know, we are, we don't want you to choose an equal partner. Um, we just want you to kind of be here, we extract a little bit, we just kind of, I don't know, fill out the survey and say, oh, look, we've had someone from Afri of African descent, or we've had, you know, a Muslim person in Europe who, who can speak about this, but we don't want to actually invite you as an equal partner in this project. Um, and then we see also within, I mean, this is in civil society's interaction um, on the day to day, but also within their own governance structures, which I think um, represent, again, some of the um, the uh, yeah, skewed power dynamics and problematic uh, patterns in terms of who is making um, who makes the decisions in some of these organizations, and then we often see that um, they might have you know some there's there's always I don't know I always say there's always a one person of color who's like trying to do everything, and the burden falls on them, and then there's a top person who's usually white usually a man who's making decisions. Um, so again, I think it's, um, it's, it's important to see the different layers within civil society organizations, in the external relations and within their own kind of organization, um, in their narratives and how this lack of um, having a, a decolonial lens is very much apparent in all different kind of um, ways and forms. Um, and I think, yeah, to, to reiterate what Seema, I mean, Seema talked about at the micro level, but um, my seven or eight months in Brussels has been me walking into rooms um, in civil society, in spaces where, when before coming here, I thought, wow, okay, we're going to be in a, you know, I don't know, when, when you think about human rights and you think about um, the, the topics that at least that civil society is tackling, um, I was not expecting to always walk in the room and be, for example, the only person of color, a person from the global south who was non-European. Um, and that in itself has had its own challenges of, you know, um, people questioning my legitimacy of being in the room um, because, hey, you're not an EU citizen. You sound different. Um, you're from South Africa. Why are you here? You know, uh, I've had that question. Like, why are you working in Europe? Um, what gives you the authority to do so? Um, and I think that in in all these different spaces, repeatedly have to uh, having to bring this up and raise the question about who is in the room, 
you know, why are we talking about uh, migration? Why are we talking about racism uh, or working towards anti-racism without having these people with lived experience in the room? Um, and you're often met by surprise or, I don't know, um, just, oh, we didn't realize that this room was so completely white and completely <laughs> European and had no people with lived experience. So um, I'm laughing, but it's because, um, I mean, yeah, I think Sima talked about the emotional labor. It is it is emotionally draining having to repeatedly say the same thing. Um, but at the same time, I think, yeah, I mean, it's important that, um, and in reference to what uh, Rachel was saying in the beginning about, you know, disrupting, interrupting, and um, uh, acknowledging, I think it's really important to do that. And to also make sure that, um, you know, when there are white allies in the room, that they do this sort of work. Um, and I must say, there are a few, they're not many, but there are a few. Um, but I think it's important for us to keep doing that and keep bringing that into the conversation. Yeah. Um, I think, so I just, maybe, yeah, maybe also uh, due to the time, since yes. you're talking about white allies, this is a good bridge to uh, to Martin. <laughs> If, uh, yes. if that's okay, and then we'll come back to you uh, in the in the discussion. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to say. Uh, right? I, I just wanted to make one last point, and then I yeah. can hand over to Martin. Um, and yeah, I was just wanted to just say that also. Um, I think another thing which civil society is not doing, and they, I mean, we've seen recently is the lack of solidarity with the cause of colonized people. Um, and I just wanted to point out the um, the silence. And complicity with many civil society in Europe when um, the situation in Palestine and the genocide in Gaza was taking is taking place, um, but particularly also in relation to repressions we're seeing in Europe against people expressing um, solidarity with Palestine and how there's been a lack of a collective European response, um, which again mirrors kind of the EU leaders and the EU institutions response um, in terms of yeah, their complicity in this genocide. Um, so to say that, you know, the EU as an institution and civil society are kind of mirroring each other in terms of, yeah, their complicity in maintaining the colonial project. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Artie, also for um, for your reflections. And um, yeah, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I'm also hearing you questioning the whole principle of, of democracy and you know, uh, exposing the the coloniality uh, of it and to be critical of concepts that are presented as universal by the European project, but are actually quite uh, colonial and um, uh, yeah, require critical conversations and also um, how that relates to actual policies. Um, so we can talk about, you know, how important it is, but if the policies uh, don't reflect that and the people in positions of power then you know those are those are empty words, and also yeah, the solidarity issue uh, I think uh, is is quite um, telling um, uh, this time around that um, yeah to to see where people stand, especially also with with all the so-called historical consciousness of never again, and then to see um, what's happening right now. So uh, thank you also Arti for your reflections, and then um, I hand it over to Martin. Thanks, Rafini. Thanks, um, Rachel, Sima, Arti for for um, all that you said. Um, I guess I will share a bit more about sort of the Decolonial Europe Day initiative, who we are, uh, what we've done so far, and what we're up to, and the way in which we try to address some of the challenges that we see um, the Decolonial Europe or the decolonial movement facing um, in Europe. But I also maybe want to start just with acknowledging that I'm still also very new to this um, journey, I, I, I guess I can say. Um, um, it's been a recent journey that for me started pretty much in 2020 as it did for many people, not only because of the Black Lives Matter movements, um, but in that context um, um, and just also express my gratitude for also many people here um, within the team and and but also beyond um, people with fewer privileges than I have how much I've learned and and it, it's been really really great um, so I just wanted to acknowledge that at the start so 
and maybe to 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 kick us off um just to recap a bit of some of the challenges that that i and i think we see as a project on that the decolonial movement in europe faces on the one end and in particular sima and arty have been talking about we see repression of decolonial voices at individual level at organizational level on the other hand we see co-optation and and what you may call decolonial washing um, of the decolonial movement where terms are emptied out of their meaning and it becomes performative um also rachel spoke about that that risk in in relation to uh, land acknowledgement um and in the light of these um challenges we 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 do see we do see our project so let me start there where who are we uh we are an initiative um, um we're called decolonial europe day um, it was taken by a few individuals um, in collaboration with existing civil society organizations and decolonizing initiatives. And in that sense, we are a bit of a hybrid initiative. We're neither existing solely of individual people, nor are we an umbrella organization. Um, you can say a bit of a, a mix of both. Um, we're currently 10 people in the project team. And while many of us are active in, in different organizations, um, professionally and, and on the volunteering basis, um, within the, the, the project team, we, we operate in a personal capacity. And last year, we organized the first edition of the Decolonial Europe Day. Um, we did basically two things. Um, we published a booklet with um, contributions, 17 contributions from um, partners, uh, decolonizing initiatives and civil society organizations, including ARALES, um, with their vision and, and answer to the question, what does it mean to de decolonize Europe? Uh, we will share the, the link in the chat. Um, and the other thing we, we did is on the 9th of May, so-called Europe Day, we organized the Decolonial Europe Day. And the core of our online program was nine sessions organized by partner organizations um, in various ways addressing topics related to decolonizing Europe or and decolonizing in general. And after the day was over, um, the question was, what now? <laughs> we primarily came together organizing this day. Um, there was overall positive feedback and there was energy enough uh, for people to say, well, we would like to continue in some form, but there was also a question of, okay, what, what does that look like? Do we simply start preparing the next edition, which is a year from now? Um, what does that look like? Um, so basically the question became, do we continue to be an initiative that organizes activities um, around one day per year? Or do we invite Decolonial Europe Day partners and related actors to take our collaboration to the next level and establish a collective or an organization that organizes this day, but also organizes potentially other activities? And it's also connected to, to sort of what role do, do we see for ourselves within, let's say, the ecosystem and the broader decolonial decolonial movement? Um, do we merely try to create a platform for pre-existing decolonial actors? Or do we also at times want to initiate or contribute to actions that um, enable the decolonial movement in Europe um, and potentially beyond to speak with one voice? And this has been quite a a dilemma for us and we've had many many discussions also a meeting in berlin and another hybrid meeting in in, in brussels um and ultimately we've arrived at the conclusion that we do think it is important to go beyond this one day event each year um which is not necessarily to say that we are aiming to uh, with with this organization that we foresee to to launch on the 9th of May of, of, of this year, so around two, two months from now. Um, we are not necessarily trying to speak for the decolonial movement in Europe, if that were even possible. I guess that would be a red flag if anyone maybe claims to speak for the movement, so to speak. Um, um, so we're not doing that, but we are trying to create the conditions and make it easier for decolonial actors in Europe and beyond to act together, to learn and unlearn from and with each other 
um, and to to move things. Um, yeah. Um, I will. So in a nutshell, I guess you can say we are trying to we we see a threefold role for ourselves. We are trying to support and amplify existing decolonial voices. We are, are trying to connect decolonial actors and we're trying to build in a way capacity or create enabling condition, conditions for that capacity to be built of decolonial actors and for them to act together. And we hope that in this way, we are on the one hand creating um, a space and a community in which typically small decolonizing initiatives and activists uh, find solidarity in the face of repression, which we talked previously about, and perhaps go beyond sort of survival politics. Um, and secondly, we hope that this collective, creating a collective beyond the day itself, um, also in a way enables us to pull in pre-existing, typically larger, typically established civil or society organizations um, and providing opportunities for them to, to engage in dialogue and to unlearn, relearn, and do better um, in whatever they're doing. Let me finish here. Thanks, everyone. Thanks uh, so much, uh, Martin, also for being more, um, for, for addressing the, the role of um, Decolonial Europe Day and how it came to be and what your plans are for the future. Um, since we have a few minutes before we head for a break, I, I was wondering, Martin, if you can briefly uh, address the question of uh, diversity within Europe. Uh, one of the previous speakers already mentioned, you know, the conversation, I believe it was Sima, um, the conversation around Islamophobia in the UK is very different than the, the conversation in France. And so every every country within Europe, although there's this idea of the European, you know, project, there's also a lot of local context. So um, how how do you deal as an initiative with uh, navigating those different contexts while we are addressing, you know, systemic issues that relate to all of the European countries? I can give it the first try, but I would also invite my my yes, colleague. Yes, uh, anyone um, who wants to, to, uh, to please do. Well, let me first also just maybe to make it even clear we're not planning on of opening a brussels office of the decolonial europe collective that aims to represent as any other umbrella organization the interest of decolonial actors whatever that then that may mean um in in brussels that's not that's not our goal um and that's i think this whole umbrella structure is is part of the problem and and leads to co colonial practices um what we do i guess how we are trying to address this is by hopefully but we are still very much in the thinking phase and then slowly starting to act to create conditions uh, simply in a way also by connecting pre-existing actors and recognizing that the systems that we're fighting are transnational even if they take different forms in different countries and local contexts they are they are transnational to create the conditions that make it possible for these actors to also see that they are transnational and that they recognize similar dynamics in different local contexts, national contexts, um, and to work together and to, to act in solidarity with one another. That would be my answer. But others, please jump in. Yeah, I don't know if, you know, Artisima or Rachel, you want to add something to that? I would just add that, um... There obviously are some base systemic issues that uh, uh, exist across the borders and at an EU level. And what I would say is that, unfortunately, some of the worst actors, for instance, on Islamophobia, uh, they copy each other. So the fact that people in the far right in France is talking about banning the headscarf in public spaces and has already done so in certain places, is something that the far right in the UK latches onto. And then, um, yeah, there's this kind of spiral effect. Um, also, this is a similar thing with what the Rwanda plan, for instance, is now something that other countries in the EU are trying to do. So it's actually vital that the struggle is transnational, that we link up transnationally. And um, 
so this is partly what we try to do with the Islamophobia campaign that I've been working on is bringing people from the UK to Germany to meet with um, activists there uh, so that they can share their knowledge and experiences. Um, and it goes both ways and it goes with France as well. So that's one yeah. way. So uh, if, I, if I understand it right, it's also uh, about anticipating possible um, uh, cha changes within in the the narrative, the, the policies, because of what you see in other contexts, you can and actually I, I see it in the Netherlands. So when it comes to the, for instance, the uh, the ban of the hijab, uh, which initially was you know the ban of the burqa, and it, it it was not you know the Netherlands was not the first country to deal with this. You you see indeed this tendency in all these uh, other European countries that actually are signaling to us that we need to be uh, prepared and that we have, need to be proactive in addressing this rather than reactive. So um, I can imagine that um, yeah, your initiative helps us to, to be uh, prepared and to, um, to, uh, to also have a, a counter response so that some things may be prevented. Um, yeah, it's, it's now two minutes past um, nine. So I do suggest we take a five minute uh, break uh, for those who want to uh, to grab something to drink uh, real quick. So we'll, we'll be back um, uh, in five. And then uh, we open the floor for questions from the audience and, uh, and further discussion. Let's start. All right, welcome back to the Decolonial Learning Session on how to decolonize Europe together with uh, speakers from Decolonial Europe Day. And uh, we are opening the floor for questions and discussion. So uh, I also invite the people in the audience to ask questions if you have any. Uh, you can leave them in the chat or raise your hand and I'll give you the floor. Um, and in the meantime, I have plenty of questions. So uh, uh, let me, uh, let me st but I already see a, a hand. So I'll give, let's see, uh, Steffi, if I'm not mistaken, the floor first, go ahead. Sorry, I have a little sticker on my camera. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you for the amazing discussion. Um, I just had one question for our speakers today. Um, I think we've seen the natural culmination of how identity politics has been instrumentalized by the far right um, to the extent that we'd possibly be able to say that we're entering a new European era, era of homo-nationalism, femo-nationalism, whatever you want to call it. How can the decolonial movement avoid falling into this trap as well, either through accusations leveled against it or because of, you know, our own internal issues. I think this is a real fear for me and I was wondering what you all thought. Thank you. Thank you for that question, Steffi. Who of the panel wants to respond first? <laughs> anyone and maybe um you know if there are also others in the audience who have thoughts about this also feel free to uh, to share but um and maybe let me uh, uh summarize the, the question if i'm uh, uh if i understand it right Steffi, your question is how do we deal with um and actually, that was the same question I also had. Uh, the, the 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 rise uh, of the the far right in European countries, and also the use of identity politics politics there. Uh, what does this mean for the decolonial movement, and how do we deal with that? I think also because the um, uh, reflections uh, that were shared, um, uh, some of them also related to the you know the white savior complex and and the kind of the I would. I interpret it also as the you know white left, but how about the white right, and how do we deal with that? And please correct me if I'm wrong, Steffi, but this was how I understood the question. Okay, I see affirmation. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't know, Artie, if you, if you maybe want to start off with your thoughts about this. I mean, I think it's a it's a really big question. Um... And I don't know if I have a, a concrete answer to it, but I think um, within the 
the decolonial movement and at least within civil society organizations there's often they fall into the trap as well of this identity politics right because um for example and now i'm thinking about again in the context of what's been happening with palestine you know the response we got among civil society saying this is not our issue you know um this is a palestinian issue it's it's you know an issue about a specific group of people and we see with um at least with the far right, you know, this this um pattern of othering which which has been happening. Um whether it's, you know, today it's about LGBTQI rights, tomorrow it's about migrants, um, the next time, and I think in the context of the UK, for example, we see how um yeah, how governments can, you know, from one day to the next decide um who else they are going to other. Um, and I think within within the movement, um, within civil society, there needs to be a better like self-critical reflection of this and how it actually manifests in, in our own spaces. Um, so, you know, for example, those working on, on um, democracy will say, oh, we work on this, but we don't work on, you know, the rights of migrants. So we don't work on, on this particular issue. I think by um, siloing, which is another a very common issue that that a lot of organizations do by saying this is not our issue not realizing that it's part of a you know the collective struggle against um you know the systems of oppression um and about envisioning a different society i think if we don't do that critical self-reflection and constantly check ourselves um yeah we we, we kind of get in the situation which we are in today so it's not really an answer but i think we do need a lot more um self-reflection and yeah to critically yeah. kind of result how are we in these how are we we reproducing this identity politics within our own spaces yeah so to also actually find is, is that also what you're saying Artie, to to find alternatives uh, or alternative ways uh, of engaging in the conversation rather than focusing on specific uh, identity aspects to see what are the elements that we can uh, make people see that it's all connected? Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think with with the with the the um the left movement, this has become, you know, I mean, I've had recurring conversations amongst like feminists, for example, and you know, gender rights movements who are saying um the far right has been better in that sense of bringing more people into the kind of circle because you know, they're maybe speaking to workers in a way in which the left is kind of isolating others, um, yeah. for example. So um, I think we do need to do a lot more work on the types of narratives we use that don't isolate, um, which goes again to this thing about learning and unlearning and how we can do it in like a productive way instead of, you know, the calling in, calling out way rather than yeah. just like telling people, you know, yeah, you're wrong, we're right, et cetera. Yeah, exactly. So um uh it's also about finding ways to engage people that not, might not ne necessarily feel that decolonizing is also about them and actually their you know uh, their rights and their um yeah their position in european society and i i recognize this also in the in the dutch context where i think actually a lot of people voting for you know far right parties are you know people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds who could be allies because of the overlap in, in, in the socioeconomic position. But I see, I believe Rachel also wanted to respond and I see Sima's hand, so I'll come back to you also. But Rachel, please uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was gonna, <clears throat> sort of building off of that. I think um, it seems like the right is just very good at sort of forgiving each other and sort of like building coalition by sort of really getting over, you know, imperfection <laughs> if if they're sort of like subscribing to the general uh trajectory um and i think i think the left isn't isn't as good at that and i do think it kind of comes back a little bit to what i was saying is that like kind of practicing that disrupting and acknowledging as part of like being able to sit with the discomfort of these contradictions that are everywhere and inherent and in all of us and that you know if we if we really do want to kind of build coalition we kind of have to move forward 
beyond perfectionism, but that doesn't mean not acknowledging, you know, the harm that is happening, but like not letting it sort of let us cut cut people off. And I think, yeah, it is important to sort of build those transnational relationships to build coalitions as a bit of an an inviting into that discomfort. And I think, yeah, like um I think there's there's been quite a bit of conversation um about this way in which like the right has kind of almost co-opted our messages and twisted them and sort of this kind of like populist anti-establishment um mentality but then sort of driving it towards um yeah instead of uh turning it against the the billionaires and the the oligarchs um turning it against migrants and you know lower socioeconomic uh yeah. folks yeah so it's also uh are you also kind of referring to this you know cancel culture dynamics where if you don't um you know if you're you're not um perfect then you're actually uh against us if you're if you're not for us you're you're against us and is there room to 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 educate uh, together to learn together so that we can actually build movements and you know if you make a mistake uh there's there there, there needs to be room for the conversation as long as there's willingness to grow to learn uh, rather than oh you make one mistake and uh, you know we uh, you're out is that kind of the dynamics that you're yeah, and really kind of sitting, like being able to acknowledge and sit with the the discomfort, because I think there is so much that is done in so many civil society spaces, but it's definitely seen it in European civil society spaces to like find it impolite to sort of acknowledge some yeah. of these um, pretty glaring contradictions and sort of harms. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Rachel. I believe Seema also wanted to respond, and then Martin. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Um, to the specific question, I agree with what's been said before. I think there's also a danger in assuming that uh, people from white working classes, for instance, are inherently going to go to the far right or inherently support identity politics. And uh, there, there's a sense of kind of giving up before we've even started. I actually think um, all of the ideas and anti-colonial ideas are, are actually ideas that most people, if the truth was known, are likely to be quite sympathetic towards. And in the UK, for example, we just actually had the election of George Galloway. Um, I don't know how many of you might have been following this, but what George Galloway actually did was unite uh, white working class votes and Muslim community votes by making a protest stand against the Gaza genocide. However, he does have some quite uh, kind of anti-woke talking points that he also uses. So I don't agree with everything that he says, but what he showed and what the left can actually maybe learn a bit from is that it is totally possible to unite um, what we perceive to be different groups because there is a class, uh, there is a shared class. Um, and also before that, there was Jeremy Corbyn who had quite a broad mass support. Um, and that again was uniting people from across classes. And he did have quite a strong anti-imperialist politics compared to other politicians. Um, what I would say though, is that we need to do a lot more work in left and progressive spaces because they're just, I would say they're just not good enough right now. And this question of lived experience is not about diversity and inclusion, it's about representation. Because I think like say, it's it's true we don't just want token diversity but that can also be used as a way to say oh it's not about having people of color in the space it's about having the right politics and i think that's that also isn't correct we need both um and it's also people of color and migrants who should be at the be leading this um fight against the far right as well um and i think that because we don't have that in left spaces that's part of why we're also actually losing. So I, I don't want to talk too long, but that's what I think. And I think also having white allies supporting people who are taking all of this emotional burden to keep being in more like disruptive and leadership spaces without necessarily having leadership titles, which I think are very hierarchical and not actually decolonial. And that's another contradiction of the civil society space we're acting in um, is also really important. And finally, on the Palestine question, I think that's also really important because there's some very key principles like with Ukraine and, and Palestine that people could like 
just support or state. For instance, Palestinians obviously have the right to armed resistance against occupation and colonization. But this is something that people in civil society especially seem really scared to say, even though Palestinians are saying it themselves. And given the position of power that we're in right now, we need to be able to state these things because that is about what anti-colonialism is. So really sticking our necks out, I think, is important. And yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Sima. So many points you you addressed, uh, but maybe to to briefly summarize, um, yeah, really interesting point that it is possible to unite people uh, on on specific issues uh, for for the bigger picture and to to be vigilant about you know sh the, the narrative and and making sure that people really understand the um, uh, the reality of. Um, of the, um, the limitations also of the European, you know, uh, ideas and how they can actually uh, unite um, uh, uh, across across races and and um, and I think I think also historically, you know, also in the global south, there was a lot of people, you know, workers who who were indeed uh, um, initially in, engaged in class struggle and then you know um, in the fight against capitalism, there were also this dynamics of the colonial idea. So I think historically, there's also a lot of um, connections there. Uh, but I, I am uh, mindful of the time and I see Martin has his hand up. So I'll, I'll give the floor to you. Thanks. I, I just wanted to add one more, one more element to what's been said already, sort of reflecting on the fact that I would, I, I don't have the data, but it almost seems like the right and the extreme right is better on putting sort of diverse people in leader position leadership positions and thereby becoming more acceptable um to to the mainstream uh, looking less extreme because they have a person of color or a woman in charge um in in, in response to that reality um i feel like we sort of on, on the left need to be way more in a way self-critical indeed about what really matters which is not to say that lived experience doesn't matter let's be let's be super clear um but for example language like trust women um in certain contexts that is a very valid point to make but in a context where women are in for example a board of an organization and um so-called ordinary members criticize the board i think in and I have experienced this type of uh, dynamic, actually, um, uh, sort of I, in that context, I personally consider that problematic, I think, um, because we we I think we we need to keep an eye on the power structures and who's who's in charge. Uh, that is not to say that sexism cannot show up in the way that and patriarchy in the way I I act and that, that should be called out, of course. So I just, yeah, sort of the way in which also feminists, intersectional feminists, um, decolonial language is in a way sometimes weaponized in order to uphold certain power structures in so-called decolonial intersectional feminist spaces and movements. Um, yeah, I have two examples and, and yeah, th that's one of my takeaways. Yeah, thanks, Martin. Actually, that was also one of my thoughts when Sima addressed the, the, the question of representation, where we indeed see people of color in in, in far right um, of politics being very, you know, uh, visible and vocal. And it also shows that we also need to be critical of that, I think, representation aspect where, yeah, seeing, you know, a face who looks like us uh, is not enough for uh, for the politics. And I completely agree with Sima that Yes, we need both, but I think sometimes, um, yeah, people um, are already happy with just you know the 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 recognition and and, and forget to have those critical conversations. So uh, and indeed, it, it shows how uh, how much harder the left has to really work uh, to uh, uh, to create those spaces also for um, marginalized people. So, uh, and I also saw that Sima added something in the chat. So just want to make sure that people um, um, uh, also uh, hear this. Um, Sima mentions, forgot to add 76% uh, of the British public supported a ceasefire in Gaza as early as uh, October, despite totally hostile mainstream media narrative. Example of the way movement work can puncture stereotypical opinions. So thank you also Sima for that addition. 
um, we are up for time. So I do have to um, wrap up the session uh, for now. Um, I do want to make sure that people know where to find you and follow you. So uh, if one of you wants to share uh, from the speakers, where can people find you and what is um, coming up uh, with the Colonial Europe data people can uh, check out. Martin? Yeah, unless someone else wants to go, but I, I can do it. We have on the 9th of May, the Decolonial Europe Day, the second edition. Um, we hope around a month from now that we start the registrations. Um, if you want to make sure that you, and you're not yet on our mailing list, please just send us an, an email at hello at decolonial.eu. Um, and we'll make sure you, you receive the, the invitation to register. Um, and Rachel already shared the, the links to our social media channels in the in the chat um, on Instagram, Twitter, and, and Facebook. You can you can find us. So please get in touch. And yeah, thank Great. you. Thank you. Um, well, to Martin, to Rachel, to Sima, to Artie, and everyone who attended today. Big thanks. It was really really rich uh, uh, conversation. This was a decolonial learning session from RLS, a fan decolonial network and organization in Amsterdam. And for more interviews and or information, please visit our website, YouTube channel or Facebook page. There you will find our blog page where we also share recordings from uh, other sessions and of course also this session. And reading and viewing tips will be sent by email in a handout after this session. And the tips will also be published on our blog, including the booklet of uh, Decolonial Europe Day. So we'll include that. And if you want to stay informed about these sessions, you can sign up for our newsletter. As mentioned before, donations are always welcome for class of sessions and reimbursement of speakers. So you can find the information to donate on our uh, website. Um, thanks again to everyone uh, for joining us and have a good night for now.